Just like there are low quality cars driving down the road and high quality cars driving down the road that ultimately can get you to the same place, there's high quality proteins and there's low quality proteins. The difference is low quality proteins don't really get you to the same place because it takes a lot more of them. And you can look at a nutrition label and it'll tell you there's X amount of grams of protein in something, but that does not mean that it's a quality protein. There's no quality or protein quality score when you look at a food. You have to do some digging. So I've got the seven lowest quality proteins. Let's go ahead and jump in. The first one sounds really weird at first because it sounds like something that I've talked about as being beneficial before, but you gotta listen carefully. Regular yogurt, not Greek yogurt, not Bulgarian yogurt, regular processed yogurt. I don't know if you know this, but if you get regular processed yogurt that's not like Greek or strained, it's heated sometimes heated for 20 plus minutes at over 80 degrees Celsius. That's enough to really denature proteins, not to mention a lot of the additives and stuff they add to it. It's just not as good of a quality of protein, but you don't have to take my word for it. There's literature that looks at this, at heating dairy and what it does to the protein. There was a study that was published in the International Dairy Journal. It looked at treating dairy for literally 26 seconds. At 87 degrees Celsius, it denatured the protein by up to 34%. So the protein quality just nose dives when it's exposed to high heat. And the pasteurization process that we have to go through with a lot of dairy does that. It does that with milk too. I know people can't get raw dairy in a lot of states, but that's why if I consume milk, I'm usually consuming raw dairy, but I don't wanna rub that in people's faces because I know it's hard to get in certain places. But when it comes to yogurt, you want the fermented stuff that is not high heat treated. The next low quality protein is one that I don't have a ton of beef with, but I don't think that it should be your first choice. And that's going to be a protein bar. And even if you choose a protein bar, there's some things you need to look out for. You should be looking for whey protein isolate or whey protein concentrate at the very least within the first couple of ingredients. What I don't want to see is maybe soy protein concentrate so much, or I don't wanna see milk protein isolate because that is not nearly as high as qual high quality of protein, excuse me, because you're not concentrating or isolating the whey, okay? Now, that's not the problem that I have with it. We could go back and forth and talk about which protein isolates are better or worse, but the problem that I have is all the other garbage that goes along with it. Are you potentially decreasing digestibility? How much has this been heated and denatured? Are there other options? Could you opt for jerky? Could you opt for biltong? Could you opt for beef stick? Could you opt for a protein shake that might literally be better, right? Just weigh out your options. This next one is important because there's caveats. There's caveats with everything. Processed meat. Now, when I say processed meat, there's a couple of different categories, but typically processed meats have been high heat treated or they are adding a lot of different compounds to them that A, may not be that great for you, but B, might affect the digestibility. There was a study that was published in the Annual Review of Food Science and Technology that looked at processed meats, and it found that when processed meats were high heat treated, when they exposed them to super high heat, it would oxidize amino acids and denature the protein. Now, is that better than eating a Snickers bar? Yeah, I mean, I'd probably rather eat a processed meat than a Snickers bar, realistically. But you're not getting the same quality of protein as you would get if you were eating, say, like fresh meat or good quality organic meat. You're getting something that's been kind of denatured and, well, processed. But if you go for like a deli meat that's like a cold cut that doesn't have additives, hasn't been high heat treated, like Applegate or Dietz & Watson or some of these other ones, like those are okay. Even Boar's Head has some decent ones that don't have additives and aren't super high heat treated. The other thing you have to be aware of is that when protein or when meat has been dried and the drying process has been expedited, like in a dehydrator or in a, a jerky maker, a lot of times this will denature the protein as well. In fact, it can actually oxidize and denature proteins similarly to high heat. Now that doesn't mean don't eat jerky, like at all. Like by all means, I will electively have jerky if I have nothing else. I'll take jerky over a protein bar any day of the week. But try to look for biltong. That's air dried. The slower process makes it so that you have less of this denaturing occurring. There's sort of a almost fermentation that can occur too, depending on how it's sort of marinated. So that's a very important piece to remember. Additionally, going for things like beef sticks or fermented beef sticks. 
these are gonna be even better because they're not super dry. That's why they're a little more moist, right? More moist than jerky. So I just choose to go for that whenever possible. Also watch the sodium intake with it. A lot of salt can actually lower the digestibility of the actomycin, making it so it's a slightly lower quality protein. So like when you're looking at this, my limit with like a, a jerky or like a biltong is like maybe like a 700 to 800 milligrams of sodium in a serving. If it starts going above that, I'm like, maybe we're having some denaturing happening here. I remember there's an old Gordon Ramsay video when he's like cooking eggs and he's like, you never want to add salt early on when you're cooking eggs. I don't know if you've seen this video. It's a really famous one of his short how to cook eggs properly. And he mentions always add the salt towards the end so you don't denature the proteins. Not only is this good for cooking, it's also good for the digestibility. Next up is farmed fish. It is lower quality, even when it comes down to the protein availability. Now with this, we can look at an interesting study that was published in Food Science and Nutrition, found that wild tilapia had significantly more omega-3s than farmed tilapia. So we know that there is a difference in omega-3s, but then there was a study published in American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This was wild. They had subjects consume corn oil or omega-3s. Okay, they did this for eight weeks. Corn oil did nothing as far as muscle protein synthesis. However, when omega-3s were in the mix, protein synthesis elevated significantly and mTOR elevated significantly in conjunction with high concentration of amino acids and insulin in the blood, which is what would happen when you ate protein. When you eat protein, you have insulin spikes and you have, of course, amino acid spikes. So omega-3s increase the availability of protein. So when you eat farmed fish that is denatured in omega-3s, you're just missing out. Is it better than nothing? Yeah, it probably is, so don't get me wrong. But if you have the choice to go with a wild caught cheaper fish or a more expensive farm fish, go with the cheaper wild caught. And you can never go wrong with something like sardines or anchovies or mackerel, as gross as you might think they are or as much as you love them. They are a tremendous anabolic source of protein. Now, I'm also gonna mention a sponsor here because personally, I like recommendations. You can take it or leave it, but I'll be real here. I put a link down below for Bomar Nutrition's protein powder, their whey protein. They recently made the switch upon some advice from me getting rid of all artificial compounds. Okay, so nothing weird in there. We're not talking any more artificial sweeteners or anything. I told them, look, I love the taste of your stuff, but let's try to make this so that my audience would actually like it too, because I know my audience is really adamant about that. So they have stevia sweetened, like strawberry milkshake. They have cookies and cream. They have some really good tasting whey protein powders that are a tremendous source of protein. And you can bag on me all you want for having a sponsor, but if I was watching this video, I would absolutely want a recommendation on what I would think is the best protein powder. So whey protein powder, whey protein isolate, whey protein concentrate, whatever agrees with your stomach is going to be a tremendous source far beyond say a protein bar or something like that. You have to check it out. Literally tastes like a strawberry milkshake. Like their banana one is insane. Like my kids love it. It tastes just like a banana cream pie, especially if you make it with a little bit of raw milk, if you can get your hands on some. It's, it's game over. Anyhow, that link down below gets you a special discount as well. So I'm not just talking about a product, you actually save some moolah as well. So that link, top line of the description for Bomar Nutrition's whey protein. Okay, this next one is bad news bears. I don't have any problem with the food specifically. I have a problem with trying to use it as a protein source. Peanut butter. Okay, it all comes down to the protein to calorie ratio. Eight grams of protein for 200 calories? It just does not add up. It doesn't make sense. So I have no problem with eating peanut butter as a literal fat source, but eating it as a protein source is a recipe for disaster. Like if you try to get <laughs> hundreds of grams of protein from peanut butter, you're not gonna be happy with the end result. Not to mention when we look at the PDCAA score, the protein digestibility corrected amino acid score, that's how much actual amino acid concentration there is and quality of the amino acids in the protein when you actually correct for the different aminos that are in it. Well, I'll give you an example. Wheat is like a 0.45 on a scale of you know, zero to one. Okay, meat is as close to one and eggs are as close to one as you can really get. Peanut butter is about a 0.7. So you're basically a plant-based protein that is not exactly the highest quality. So A, too many calories. B, you're not just really getting the effect. Number six is farmed eggs. I know they're cheap but you really don't wanna lean into these as a primary source. And the reason is, well, for one, there's probably some stuff we don't want in there. Who knows what's going on over big egg land, right? Like, I don't know, maybe a bunch of antibiotics, but that's not what I'm talking about. That's not where I'm an expert. 
What I can tell you is eggs have a tremendous PDCAA score, okay? Just about as close to a one as you can get. But when you look at the literature that was published in Pier J, it was kind of scary. Okay, they looked at farm-raised eggs versus free-range eggs, and they found, hey, the protein amounts about the same. But when they actually looked at 17 amino acids specifically that they were studying, they found that the farm-raised eggs had significantly lower levels of these amino acids, meaning that you are kind of getting ripped off. You're kind of getting what you pay for. So even though you're paying less money for farm-raised eggs, the actual amount of amino acids and concentration you're getting is much less. So perhaps it's better to buy the expensive eggs that are 30% more and get 30% more protein availability without the hidden nastiness, right? The next one is solo plant proteins. I have to say this, a plant protein that is solo, that is not combined to create a complete amino acid profile, although can still be listed as a protein on a label, it is inferior. There are a few exceptions, but an example is like straight pea protein when they don't add hemp or don't add pumpkin to get like the full spectrum, okay? It is an inferior protein. There is a study that was published in Nutrients that looked at that very important PDCAA, okay? The Protein Digestibility Corrected Amino Acid Score. One being a perfect amount, one being the perfect score. Eggs, again, about as close to that one as you can get. Milk, very close, things like that. When you start looking at the plants, you realize they're ranging from like 0.3 up to like 0.7. Most of, so you have to start combining things. So it's, you can't just like use MyFitnessPal and track your protein, including your plants, and really think you're getting an accurate number. Even though it does all end up in a labral amino acid pool, it's not the same, okay? One exception, and I'm not the biggest fan of soy, but is soy. Soy can get like a 0 0.9 to 0 0.97 score on the PDCAA scale. However, you really want to go for like something like NATO that's fermented if that's going to be the case, or hempe or tempeh. The fermentation process breaks down, makes the protein a little bit more digestible, and of course goes without saying you want to elect to have organic. But I don't think that soy is going to be like the end-all be-all for you. I think it's perfectly tasty and has places, but in my humble opinion, you really need to be mixing these amino acids and you really need to put a lot of work in. That being said, some of the plant-based community knows how to do it. So just to recap, you've got regular yogurt, you've got protein bars that you should probably be limiting, you've got garbage processed meat that you should be subbing out for maybe decent quality deli meat when it comes to time. We've got farmed fish, we've got peanut butter that we should probably be limiting, we've got lower quality farmed eggs, and solo plant proteins. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.